We'll talk about the FBI plot, not the conservative plot, not the radicals plot, the FBI plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. We'll talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to talk about this idea of big government. Big government is not your big brother. Big government is not big daddy government, as we sometimes joke. Big government is actually like a scary Godzilla. They will eat our families alive, eat our society alive, if we allow big government to dominate the way that they are beginning to dominate under the Biden administration. This is what I mean. The Biden administration has pushed, and I use that phrase very carefully, has pushed, because now they're backing away from it, now that we've all noticed it. The Biden administration has push, pushed a critical race theory practicing radical group. They have pushed this uh, using taxpayer money. Now, I call it a critical race theory practicing radical group because they are practicing critical race theory, but they don't admit that they are. But it's very obvious that they are. And the Biden administration, by the way, is absolutely full of these radicals. The latest example is Biden's Department of Education issued guidance for local schools around the country to open in the face of COVID-19. And in this guidance, they included a link, a hyperlink to a handbook from a group called the Abolitionist Teaching Network. The Abolitionist Teaching Network issued a guide of their own called A Guide for Racial Justice and Abolitionist Social and Emotional Learning. So this link was put out by Biden's Department of Education. Biden's Department of Education is funded by you and by me, by our tax money. So if you click this link, it is, uh, the hyperlink occurs uh, over the the paragraph in uh, Biden's Department of Education's uh, guide. And this is what the paragraph says that contains the link. Schools are microcosms of society. Therefore, culturally responsive practices and intentional conversations related to race and social emotional learning are the foundation for participating in a democracy and should be anchor tenants in building a school-wide system of educational opportunity. So it's within this paragraph that Biden's Department of Education uh, put a hyperlink to this radical abolitionist, this abolitionist teachers network. So the abolitionist teachers network guide, if you click on that link, and um, I'm pretty sure they removed the link by this point since this story broke. But if you were to click this link and look at the Abolitionist Teachers Network guide, this is what you would find. You would find positions advocating for teachers and school administrators, you know, the people that are talking to our kids, teaching our kids, who essentially have custody of our kids all day long. This guide, this group, this radical leftist group pushes educators to, quote, disrupt whiteness and other forms of oppression, end quote. That's their phrase, disrupt whiteness. Now, you and I know that disrupt whiteness, what they mean by that is they're essentially admitting that they believe the idea that all white people are racist just by nature of the color of our skin. And therefore we are tied, all white people are tied to white supremacy. Because otherwise, why would they phrase it the way that they phrase it? There'd be no reason to disrupt whiteness if they were merely referring to it as the color of your skin, but they're not. They're referring to this critical race theory belief that all white people are inherently racist based on the fact that they are white people. More on that in just a second. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. Now, if you think it's troubling that the Biden administration would endorse a group who thinks that all white people are racist because of the color of their skin, just wait until you hear what else is in this guide, this abolitionist teacher's guide. We'll get to that in a second. But first, I want to talk about Nutrafol. Nutrafol for men. So they have products for women and for men, but specifically, I want to talk to the dudes that watch my show today. If you are balding, if you notice a receding hairline, if you are worried about the state of your hair, then this product is for you. Um, It's non-pharmaceutical. It's holistic, and everyone knows, you know, I'm a, I'm a crunchy, vegan, kale shake eaten uh, conservative here. So if you tell me something is holistic, you probably have caught my ear. So this has been clinically proven to help men um, grow thicker and healthier hair um, and to reduce baldness, really, to increase scalp coverage of hair. And 1,500 top doctors also endorse this product, and that's why, because it's been clinically shown. So if you guys are uh, the ones who are having this issue and you want a little bit better hair, try out Nutrafol. You can grow thicker, healthier hair and support our show. 
by going to Nutrafol.com and entering the promo code Liz. That's very important, by the way, to enter the promo code Liz to save $15 off your first month's subscription. This is their best offer anywhere, and it's only available to U.S. customers for a limited time, plus free shipping on every order. Get $15 off at Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code Liz. Nutrafol.com, promo code Liz. So back to this guide, this abolitionist teacher's guide. Uh, They advocate that teachers in public schools across our country should, quote, remove all punitive or disciplinary practices that spirit murder black, brown, and indigenous children. So let's talk about that phrase for a second, spirit murder. What is spirit murder as defined by this group? Well, the co-founder of the group, her name is Bettina Love. Remember that name, Bettina Love. She co-founded this group, but she wrote back in 2019 an entire article about the idea of spirit murder. I read the entire thing today. It's quite something. If you're interested in reading it, just Google her name and spirit murder. Uh, She defined spirit murder as, quote, a slow death, a death of the spirit, a death that is built on racism and intended to reduce, humiliate, and destroy people of color, end quote. Now, of course, that sounds bad. We don't want to reduce, humiliate, or destroy people of color. Of course not. Obviously not. But I looked up, what's an example of something that she would consider to be a spirit murder? Are these actual egregious incidents that are a violation of the law? Or what are they? Well, some of the examples that I found, a Rutgers professor, for example, wrote about being spirit murdered. She said she was spirit murdered during her undergrad experience when she got an F on a paper because she plagiarized within that paper. She plagiarized a college paper, and she got a failing grade on that paper because of that, and she said she was spirit murdered because of that. Well, it sounds like she should have gotten an F on that paper if she plagiarized it. I don't understand what this has to do with race or what this has to do with anything other than you're not supposed to plagiarize. Um, There's an additional example which is ironic because the same Rutgers professor later claims that when women of color in academia are plagiarized, it's also spirit murder of those women of color. So she was spirit murdered for being the one who plagiarized, but then in the same article she says, and when she's plagiarized, she's also spirit murdered. So as you can see, it's it's a bit difficult to understand this concept because it's ridiculous. Another example that I found, teachers uh, dressed up one time at one school, dressed up like Mexicans and the border wall for Halloween. And this apparently was a spirit murder of Mexicans. Now, it sounds like a funny Halloween costume to me. I think this whole wokeism around Halloween that you can't culturally appropriate anybody else, I think that's so stupid. That's literally the point of Halloween is to dress up like other people. Um, This is obviously a big cultural issue in our nation. I have no idea if they did it in a particularly derogatory way, but if they were representing Mexicans climbing over the border wall, so? So what? Well, apparently, this was a spirit murder. So that, in and of itself, that's the definition. That's an idea of what spirit murder is. Again, really important to remember that the Biden administration's Department of Education linked to this abolitionist teachers network group whose guide talks about making sure that education is not is not tolerant of spirit murder. So this guide also lists um, demands from these abolitionist teachers. These demands include free anti-racist therapy for white educators and support staff. Well, I would love a better definition of what free anti-racist therapy is. First of all, nothing's free, so who do you want to pay for that? You want the taxpayers to pay for that? So you want the taxpayers to pay for essentially what's re-education because you want to tell white people that they're racist just because of their white skin. So you want taxpayers to tell certain citizens that they're bad based on their skin color also in this guide. So in this guide, this guide also says that standards for learning in American schools are rooted in Eurocentric norms and do not, quote, empower, love, affirm, or free uh, children. And they're talking about black, brown, and indigenous children. So my question when I read this too is, this is one of the fundamental problems about, or with critical race theory and with allowing this ideology to infiltrate our society is it's not just racist against white people, and it is, But it also tells black children and brown children that they're oppressed, that they're not free. And they are. We are so fortunate to live in a society where no matter the color of our skin, we have, we enjoy equality under the law. But critical race theory not only 
teaches that white children are racist. They teach black children that they're oppressed, that they're enslaved, that they're not free. And that's not true. That's simply not true. So going back to the founder of um, this group, Bettina Love, once more, she, she says that the purpose of the network in general, and this is not just the guide that was linked by the Department of Education, but the purpose of the Abolitionist Teachers Network in general, quote, is dedicated to not creating new schools or reimagining schools, but destroying schools that do nothing but harm black and brown children. So I guess on that, on that particular topic, Bettina Love and I agree, we should abolish public schools that do not educate black and brown children. Like maybe the public schools in Baltimore where the passing grade or the passing, the rate of uh, children that are literate by the end of high school is abysmal, abysmal. They are doing nothing but harming black and brown children or the public schools who are indoctrinating kids in critical race theory. They are doing nothing but harming these black and brown children. Or the schools that are teaching kindergartners and preschoolers transgender ideology. They are doing nothing but harming black and brown children. So yes, on that, Ms. Love, you and I agree. Let's destroy those public schools and give that money to other schools that will better educate our children. If only that's what she meant, though. So she goes on to say, quote, if you don't recognize that white supremacy is in everything we do, then we got a problem. And she says of their group, I want us to be feared. So again, critical race theory teaches, even if you don't use those three words, critical race theory, the tenets of critical race theory include the belief that every single white person is racist inherently by the nature of the color of their skin. And that is what this group teaches. That is what this group once taught in public schools and the Biden Department of Education linked to this group. So it's not, it's not just Bettina Love. There's another co-founder. She's a fellow board member at the organization named Brandilyn Tassault. And she described herself as, quote, an educator of white teachers trying to help other white teachers uh, trouble their internalized white supremacy and anti-blackness. So why is this so egregious, we might be asking. I mean, that's obvious, aside from the, the egregious racism. Why is this so egregious today? Well, it's because... Um, Part of the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan, this was supposed to be COVID-related, right? Part of the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan included $122 billion for the Department of uh, Education to distribute to state agencies. The state agencies would then give this funding to local school systems. So these local education agencies in states across the country, which are getting federal taxpayer money, are required by this legislation, by the American Rescue Plan, to give at least 20% of that money that they have received to address uh, learning loss. Learning loss because children were forced to go to school via Zoom during COVID because public health officials and government officials did not follow the science. We don't have to go down that rabbit hole. But 20% of the money is supposed to go to address learning loss through programs, and this is where it gets very sticky, that, quote, consider students' academic, social, and emotional needs. So the social and emotional needs is, again, back to where this abolitionist teachers network and their plan factors in. This is where the Biden Department of Education linked to their guide, all full of wokeism and critical race theory. Now, when conservatives discovered this, the Biden Department of Education had a spokesperson that told Fox News, and I quote, The department does not endorse the recommendations of this group, nor do they reflect our policy positions. It was an error in a lengthy document to include this citation. I don't believe that for a minute. I do not think it was an error. I do not think it was a mistake. The only error actually would be uh, admitting their actual policy position. And that's what they were doing by nature of including this hyperlink. It was an admission that these are the people they listen to. Bettina Love is a radical, but she's a radical education activist. This This is her bread and butter. This is her meat and potatoes. This is what she does. This is who the people in the Biden administration listen to. I mean, Bettina Love is a college professor and a political activist. As I said before, she equates spirit murder in her writings with actual physical violence. She perpetuates the Black Lives Matter lie about cops shooting Black people for being Black without any repercussion. And she operates under this dangerous premise that all Black people are oppressed. So don't tell me that the Biden administration, that this was an error. I don't accidentally link to this group. I don't make a mistake linking to a group that advocates essentially for racism 
to be institutionalized in the United States. That's not a mistake. The mistake is that they pulled information from that network and didn't mean to admit it to the American people that this is, this is the ideology that they're perpetuating. Essentially, this is the Women's March and Black Lives Matter all over again. The Women's March was run um, by anti-Semites, by Linda Sarsour, by radical leftist Marxists. Black Lives Matter was run by Patrice Coolers, radical leftist, admitted Marxist. All of these people practiced critical race theory, even if they didn't use those three words, critical race theory. Well, now it's part of the Biden administration and they know how toxic it is because they're denying it, but their denial just rings empty because we know that the radicals in the Biden administration actually embrace this poisonous ideology. Okay, let's talk for a second about ExpressVPN. My security and my safety, especially as a public figure, is very important to me. And it's become even more important to me as my family has expanded. And I feel that my privacy can be violated very easily by my internet service provider because my internet service provider can look at every website that I visit. They can collect my search history. They can then take that search history and they can sell that to advertising companies who can use my personal data and they can target me with advertisements based on that. Fortunately, there's a solution. ExpressVPN is the solution. Even when I'm at home, I never go online without using ExpressVPN because their app reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so that your internet service provider cannot see your searches and then sell your information. They also, ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting your data, 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. All you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. So visit my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Liz, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash Liz. Expressvpn.com slash Liz to learn more. Protect yourself online. Your family deserves to be safe and you deserve your privacy. So one more note I want to make about critical race theory before we move along here. And remember the theme of this, of this whole uh, show today is, you know, big government is Godzilla. They, if we let them get out of control, they will destroy your family. They will ruin society. We see that with the Biden Department of Education. And we also see in states across the country who are taking action against critical race theory, they are banning this poisonous ideology from being indoctrinated or from, from being taught in schools, indoctrinating children, we see the left struggling a bit with how to respond to this because conservatives have every right, especially the state level, to ban this. And Democrats don't want to admit that they support a racist ideology, but it's very important to their political agenda that this be included in children's minds from the time children are very young. So basically what the left does is they, they everything they can do, they do to misrepresent the truth. And we see this in action um, just this week. The Huffington Post ran an article titled, Texas Senate bill drops teaching requirement that Ku Klux Klan is, quote, morally wrong. Well, that sounds pretty bad. That makes those who, uh, critics of critical race theory, it makes them sound pretty bad. It seems like, by a, if that headline is accurate, it seems like that would make the proponents of critical race theory who claim that critical race theory is just a perspective on history written by those who've been oppressed or from the perspective of those who've been oppressed it seems like it would make that characterization accurate if this headline is true. Well, the headline, of course, is not true. Rich Lowry at the National Review um, just absolutely smacked this down. This is what he said. He said, quote, Democrats added a bunch of concepts and documents that school kids should know in the anti-critical race theory bill that passed the House a few weeks ago. The list was incredibly detailed and extensive when it's the role of the State Board of Education, not the legislature, to get into the weeds of the specifics of the curriculum. Besides, many of the items are already covered in the curriculum. It was widely expected that the Senate would pare down the House bill, and that's what it did, including cutting a provision citing the KKK. This emphatically does not mean that Texas is banning teachers about, or te banning teaching about the KKK. Anyone saying otherwise is misinformed or lying. The bill does not subtract anything from the current curriculum and says so explicitly. This is a phrase from the piece of legislation. Nothing in this section may be construed as limiting the teaching or instruction in the essential knowledge and skills adopted under this subchapter, end quote. Again, it's a lie that's, it's an easy lie. And that's what the left really specializes in. They're basically just good advertisers. They come up with these snappy slogans, these very simplistic lies that are easy to remember and portray the other side as inherently bad people. And then they disseminate this narrative throughout social media, on mainstream media networks, from the mouths of Democrat politicians. And that's an example of this. It's a very simplistic lie to say, well, 
Critics of critical race theory must be bad because they don't want children taught about the KKK, you know, the most racist organization our country has ever known. Well, of course we want that taught to our children because if we don't teach actual history, then we will be doomed to repeat it. But make no mistake, it's a lie. In what's happening in Texas, the anti-critical race theory bill does not, under any circumstance, ban teaching about the KKK. The Democrats are lying. Again, big government, big government. So you might remember during the first summer of COVID, there was a plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Now, Whitmer is the COVID crackdown queen, is what I would call her here. She had the most draconian mandates. She violated themselves, her own mandates herself, by the way. Um, she's a very crazy masker, very crazy lockdown lady. And even when people in her state said, hey, this is too much for us, this is destroying us, destroying our family, she didn't listen. So a bunch of radicals, it was reported, plotted to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer and the FBI stopped this plot. Now, I, I, I think I'm speaking for a lot of people here. Um, when I say it doesn't matter what your political affiliation is, it's horrifying that uh, vigilantes or radicals or any kind of disgruntled electorate would plot to harm a politician, even if that politician is violating your rights, which, which Whitmer obviously was, but even so, it, it doesn't matter. Um, it's still the absolute wrong thing to do. And this was portrayed, the story was portrayed as conservatives. This is what conservatives do. This is, you know, this is a terrible thing. This is, of course, anybody who is against the lockdowns must be crazy, crazy. They're going to kidnap a governor. Well, a new shocking report from BuzzFeed of all places, BuzzFeed of all places, a new shocking report says that this plot was actually not discovered by the FBI, it was actually planned and operated at the behest of the FBI. An FBI informant was not just part of this plot, listening passively, feeding information to the FBI. The FBI informant organized this plot, facilitated it, and made it a reality. That, I mean, that's Shocking. I guess if you know the history of the FBI, you wouldn't be quite as uh, quite as surprised, although you should always be shocked. This is what BuzzFeed reported, and I quote here. An examination of the case by BuzzFeed News also reveals that some of those informants acting under the direction of the FBI played a far larger role than has previously been reported. Working in secret, they did more than just passively observe and report on the actions of the suspects. Instead, they had a hand in nearly every aspect of the alleged plot, starting with its inception. The extent of their involvement raises questions as to whether there would have even been a conspiracy without them." End quote. So this particular government informant that they're talking about, he actually set up the meetings between these radicals. They were previously just communicating online. He set up the physical meetings where they met for the first time, where the plans were initially developed. That's very different than just listening in on a preconceived plot. But it gets worse for that, worse than that. This informant, this FBI informant, actually incentivized these radicals to get together by paying for the food and hotels at, uh, at their first meeting. The informant then led these radicals in uh, military tactics, teaching them how to clear buildings and other Mil other military-like tactics. He taught them how to do that. They didn't know that without him. The informant was the one who prodded this loose group of radicals into actually making, um, excuse my French, but they're shit-talking, a reality. And don't get me wrong, it's wrong to talk like that, but there's a really big difference between talking like that and actually putting a plan like that into action. He's the one who pushed the group to make the plan a reality. He was the one who led the expedition to scout the cabin owned by Governor uh, Whitmer, which was the place where they planned to kidnap her. And then finally, there was one member of this group whose name was Adam Fox, and he was the most violent one. Uh, he was so violent and so extreme, actually, that he was distrusted by the rest of the group of radicals. They didn't want him to be part of the group anymore. And they actually, the rest of this group of radicals, 
uh, brought this information or brought this concern to the FBI informant, who was essentially by this time the leader of the group, and expressed concern about this individual and wanted him to be removed from the group. And the informant kept Fox, the violent one, as part of the group. This is an entirely different story now. This isn't a plot by conservatives to kidnap Governor Whitmer because of COVID lockdowns. This is entrapment by the FBI. This is a plot that was constructed by the FBI and blamed on conservatives. Well, something about that sounds familiar, doesn't it? A plot constructed by the FBI blamed on conservatives. It seems like we've been down that road before. Yes, maybe in 2016, when the FBI constructed a Russian collusion plot and then blamed it on Republicans and conservatives. The FBI has done it again when there were valid conservative, and not just conservative concerns, independent concerns, Democrat concerns, that Governor Whitmer's mandates, her quote-unquote emergency powers exceeded her authority, the FBI got involved and essentially breathed life into this violent plot. They made this a thing. They built it. They constructed it. And then they pointed their finger at conservatives and said, this is who represents you. This is who you are. They wanted the media to paint all conservatives, all lockdown skeptics, as nutcases. This is big government. This is what happens when you abandon the idea of a limited government. Big government becomes a Godzilla that will destroy your families and will destroy society. Again, if you're shocked by this, you ought to be shocked. If you're surprised by this, then you haven't been paying attention because this is big government. Our country, other countries, this is what happens when government has too much control. Also, what happens when government has too much control is they begin to collude with uh, private industry. In this case, I'm talking, of course, about big tech. Uh, We know from Jen Psaki that the government, the federal government, is colluding with big tech to censor individuals if Psaki and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris don't like what certain individuals, typically conservatives, say online. So if for some reason big tech kicks me off once and for all, I will not be silenced. I want to make sure that I have the ability to stay in touch with you. That's why I want to ask you today to subscribe to our email list at lizwheelershow.com. If you want to make sure that you never lose access to all of the content I'm delivering, the Liz Wheeler Show, please join my email list. It's very important to me that we can stay in touch if that ever does happen, God forbid, uh, because regardless, I'm here to stay. So go to lizwheelershow.com. Drop me your email, please. I'll be very respectful with it, but I want to make sure that I can keep in touch with you, reach out to you if or when big tech pulls the plug once and for all. Again, God forbid, hope this doesn't happen, but uh, give me your email and we will keep it going. Uh, LizWheelerShow.com. Okay, so Dr. Fauci lost his cool and went absolutely berserk at Senator Rand Paul. And what I would have done if I were Rand Paul is here is I would have just gently leaned forward into my microphone and said, triggered at Dr. Fauci, because that's essentially what happened here. Dr. Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul, just came with the facts and presented them to Fauci, and Fauci couldn't stand the facts because he's caught in a lie is the problem, and that's why he went ballistic. So when Rand Paul was reading the definition of -of gain-of-function research to Dr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci couldn't stand it because he knows that the NIH, when he was at the NIH, gave taxpayer money to EcoHealth Alliance, who subcontracted that uh, money to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So our tax money funded gain-of-function research at the lab that probably leaked the COVID-19 virus. So in that sense, of course, Fauci's going to go ballistic, so much so that you won't believe what he said to Senator Rand Paul. Take a listen. Dr. Fauci, knowing that it is a crime to lie to Congress, do you wish to retract your statement of May 11th where you claimed that the NIH never funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Senator Paul, I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. So what was, let you me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its yeah, transmissibility yeah. to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly, and I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. Let's okay, you get NIH. one person. Let's read from the NIH, NIH definition of gain of function. This is your definition that you guys wrote. 
It says that scientific research that increases the transmissibility among mammals is gain of function. They took animal viruses that only occur in animals and they increased their transmissibility to humans. How you can say that is not gain of function. It is not. It's a dance and you're dancing around this because you're trying to obscure responsibility for four million people dying around the world okay. from a pandemic. And let's let send Dr. Fauci. I have to, well, now you're getting into something. If the point that you are making is that the, the, the grant that was funded as a sub-award from EcoHealth to Wuhan created SARS-CoV-2. That's where you are getting. Let me finish. We don't know. Well, we don't wait know a minute. If it didn't I come can, from the lab, but you, all the evidence is pointing that it came from the lab, you, and there will be responsibility for those who funded the right. lab, including yourself. I totally This committee resent, will allow the witness to respond. I totally resent the lie that you are now propagating, Senator. Well, one of the stupid things about this video that I thought when I watched it the first time is in 2012, Fauci himself actually admitted that gain-of-function experiments could cause a pandemic. He hypothetically admitted that what we have now seen happen in reality could happen. And now he's pretending in front of the Senate that it couldn't happen. Yes, he's lying, obviously. You don't need to be, uh, uh, you don't need to run a lie test on him to know that. You can just see it in front of your very face or in front of our very eyes here. But he, did, he does play language games. He's trying to just dodge and bob and weave, if you will, around this definition because what is he going to do if he's caught? So he claims that the money that he contracted to EcoHealth Alliance, that EcoHealth Alliance gave to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, that the work that was being done at the Wuhan Institute of Virology was evaluated by experts that proved that it did not fall under the definition of gain of function. Take a listen to this. And if anybody and is happen. lying here, Senator, it is you. Uh, Senator Smith. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. And thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. And uh, thank you, Chair Murray and Ranking Member Burr. Um, I just want to say, Dr. Fauci, is there anything more that you would like to say to counteract these um, attacks on your integrity that we've all just witnessed? Well, Senator, thank you. I don't think I have anything further to say. This is a pattern that Senator Paul has been doing now at multiple hearings based on no reality. He keeps talking about gain of function. This has been evaluated multiple times by qualified people to not fall under the gain of function definition. I have not lied before Congress. I have never lied, certainly not before Congress. Case closed. Thank you. So again, this doesn't ring true. I think most of us uh, know that it doesn't ring true because we can see exactly what happened here. So the NIH realized that they were funding very dangerous gain-of-function research, and they realized that if this became public, that the American people would have a big problem with this, as we should, as we do. And so the NIH still wanted to fund this, but didn't want to have any responsibility for funding it. So all they did is they had their own panel of experts, essentially, um, analyze what was happening at the Wuhan Institute of Virology or these grants that were given to EcoHealth Alliance and just tweak the definition of gain of function enough so that uh, they could avoid the essentially the oversight mechanism at the NIH itself so that it could this funding could continue to be funneled to the Wuhan Institute of Virology without being caught and defined as gain of function, which would have disqualified the funding from being given to EcoHealth Alliance in the first place. That's essentially what we're looking at here. Because of this, because it's essentially a lie, it is, Rand Paul says that he will be referring Dr. Fauci to the Department of Justice for criminal indictment. Take a listen. You kicked off your questioning of Dr. Fauci, emphasizing federal law makes lying to Congress a felony punishable by up to five years in prison. Is it your belief based on the evidence, Senator, that he lied before Congress and broke the law? Yes, and I will be sending a letter to the Department of Justice asking for a criminal referral because he has lied to Congress. I've been saying this all along. Dr. Fauci is a liar. I said this, by the way, not to claim credit, not to pat myself on the back. I said this probably before this time last year. I think I said this as early as maybe May that Dr. Fauci was problematic because as early as the first month, two, three months of the pandemic, Last year, when we were realizing what COVID-19 was from a scientific perspective, when we were getting the first antibody studies 
to see what the prevalence of this virus was, when we were learning the infection fatality rates, when we were learning who exactly was vulnerable, when we were exploring what therapeutics would be effective in helping treat this, and learning what therapeutics were not effective and actually dangerous um, in treating this, we didn't see Dr. Fauci's mentality evolve as we learned new science about the virus. He continued to stick with what he was saying from day one. He continued to advocate for policy that reflected his dire warnings that he issued from day one that turned out not to be true. So I advocated a long time ago for Dr. Fauci to be fired. I remember how I said it because I said it in a diplomatic and gentle way on purpose because at this time, or at that time, a lot of people respected Dr. Fauci. A lot of people didn't realize that what a fraud he was. And I wanted to enlighten people without turning them off because they were counting on him uh, being this wise old grandfather leading us through the pandemic. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Fauci, we all know now, without a doubt, we all know that Dr. Fauci is a fraud. The reality of what this man has done at the NIH, the highest paid federal government employee out of 3 million government employees, gave our money, it doesn't matter if it was subcontracted, gave our money essentially to the Wuhan Institute of Virology for these gain-of-function experiments, and he knew exactly what was happening because he was at conferences where this was discussed. This gain-of-function research was described in these grant proposals. There's no way that this was negligence. If it was negligence, it was so extreme that it should be criminal. And then he lies to Congress about it. He lies to the Senate about it because he doesn't want culpability for it. It's not to say that he's single-handedly responsible for unleashing this virus on the world. It's not to say that he has the blood of all of these dead people on his hands. I'm not making that allegation. All I'm saying is his actions contributed to something that should have been avoided. He gave a weapon to the Chinese Communist Party is what happened. So yeah, the Chinese Communist Party is responsible for unleashing the virus, but Dr. Fauci is the one that gave him the weapon to do it. And then he lied about it. If only there was any hope of the Biden Department of Justice actually acting on this referral for criminal indictment. But again, big government, big government, full of swamp creatures, don't want to do anything to derail the Biden agenda, the Biden agenda being seize as much power as possible from COVID-19. So don't admit what what the truth, the reality of COVID-19 is, as long as we can use people's fear and exploit people's fear to give power to the federal government. It's terrible. Um, Okay, Joe Biden is trying to centralize power in our government in another way as well. These excessive spending bills, they're not the sexiest topic in the world, but it's very important to understand how damaging this is going to be. This big government policy is going to be to you and to me, to the American people, to American families. This isn't just stupid policy at the federal level. It's not It's not just stupid policy that affects foreign policy. This is something that will hurt your wallet on a day-to-day basis. This is Um, kitchen table economics. This is something that will actively make life harder for the average American family. What I mean by this is right now the Senate, as you know, is debating these infrastructure packages, um, the infrastructure package, the quote-unquote smaller one, which is just hard infrastructure, that's actual infrastructure, roads and bridges, versus this uh, bigger infrastructure package that the left actually wants, which isn't infrastructure at all. It contains, it's basically the Green New Deal wrapped up as roads and bridges, and it does everything from free college to amnesty for illegal immigrants to, like I said, environmental stuff. The Green New Deal is essentially what the second plan is. And the Democrats' plan, we talked about this a week ago, or two weeks ago, I believe, the Democrats' plan to get these um, incredibly expensive infrastructure bills through the Senate is to do so with reconciliation, because reconciliation is a budgetary tactic that requires only 51 votes instead of the 60 otherwise required to overcome a Republican filibuster. So that's sort of the backstory to what we're talking about. Now, Bernie Sanders wants this enormous $6 million infrastructure bill. Joe Manchin, who's supposed to be the moderate Democrat, I'm not sure, by the way, that Manchin has ever actually earned his title of being a moderate. I don't know that there's anything moderate about him. He might not be an open communist the way that Bernie Sanders is, but moderate might be a little bit too flattering for Manchin. Regardless, he wants a $2 trillion, um, a $2 trillion spending bill here, which is supposed to look small in comparison. And the Democrats are now presenting this compromise between the two, not $6 million, not, or not $6 trillion, I should say, not $2 trillion, but $3.5 trillion. This is a compromise. 
all the options are bad. Make no mistake. This is a binary choice fallacy that they are presenting to us where you have to pick one of the options that they hand you. Either $6 trillion or $3 trillion. Which looks better to you, fiscal conservatives? Well, let me tell you, none. None. No thank you. Too much spending. None. Zero. Secret option number three. None of it. And here's why. Again, this will cost you, me, our families, um, and it'll increase the cost of living in a variety of ways. So first of all, it's going to increase the cost of goods. This is obvious to anybody who's gone to the grocery store, anybody who's filled up their car with gas, um, anybody who's tried to purchase any kind of goods or service. Energy costs, I think, are up by like 50%. Some food items like milk is up 5%. Bacon is up 16%. I know, it's not a staple, but it's very important in the American way of life. 16% increase from in cost from last year. And a new Harris poll found that the American people who are being subjected to these increased prices believe that massive government spending is the reason. Well, that's because the American people aren't stupid or smart. We know what causes inflation. We know that Biden spending this massive amount of money is throwing everything off. And um, 71% of the American people are concerned that these spending proposals that haven't even happened yet could result in worse inflation. So there you go. Cost of goods are going up. And if we continue to allow the Biden administration to pass these massive spending bills, it's just going to continue. And that's what the majority of the American people believe. This is also going to cost a great deal in the climate plans that are inherent to these infrastructure packages. So we know that the left has this goal of 80% clean electricity by 2030. It's not only unrealistic and wouldn't make a difference in the overall climate of our globe, it would cost us, you and I, an incredible amount of money. Incredible amount of money. Um, and the American people don't want this because it would be paid for by raising our taxes. We'd have to give even more money to the government, or we'd pay an enormous amount uh, more in energy prices. Nobody wants that. Because, again, this is going to hurt actually middle class and lower income Americans the most, because when your energy, when your energy prices, for example, are raised, it doesn't hurt the wealthiest the same way because they have excess money, and they might not want to spend more, but it's not going to be detrimental to them providing for their family. Well, for middle income Americans and lower income Americans, that makes a difference if you're paying more every month for energy. Sometimes it can mean that you're not able to afford what you could previously afford. That's why, according to recent polling, 75% of people polled said they were unwilling to spend more than $50 a month to combat climate change. Can you believe that? I was actually shocked, to be honest, when I saw that. 75% unwilling to spend more than 50 bucks a month. 35% of people polled said they were unwilling to spend a single dollar of their own money to fight climate change. If I'd been polled, that would have been me unwilling, not a single penny. And only 15% said that they were willing to spend up to $10 of their own money on climate change policies. Yet the Biden administration wants to push through these huge quote-unquote infrastructure packages that are really just climate change policies. So going back to the tax hikes for a second, the tax hikes are going to affect us all. The Biden administration and leftist cronies claim that um, this is just going to be taxes on the rich. But in reality, these tax hikes would be the largest tax hike as a share of the economy since the year 1968. That's insane. And most of the people who will end up paying these taxes, those who will hurt the most, are families and small businesses. So the Job Creators Network argues that the left's tax proposals will actually impact one million small businesses in our country. Now, to put this in perspective, only 8% of small businesses say that they've fully recovered from the pandemic obviously. 87% um, of small businesses say they are concerned about potential tax increases. This is very significant. So when you actually parse out Biden's infrastructure packages and what it means to the American people, the people do not like it. The people do not want it. They actively oppose it. So Grover Norquist um, summarized some of these proposals, these spending proposals from the left. This is what he said, quote, 29 tax increases. $3.6 trillion in higher taxes, 87,000 new IRS agents with something to do, with something to do to go look at over, go look at over your personal economic privacy. This raises taxes on small businesses, on large businesses. Can you even imagine? 87,000 new IRS agents. We'll be paying for it. You and I. 
It'll come out of our wallets, out of our paychecks. And then, of course, the idea of the Green New Deal wrapped in you know roads and bridges as these infrastructure packages are, um, the purpose of this is to create this big government entitlement society, kind of like what we've seen in Europe. If the Biden administration spending packages pass through, then more than 50% of the American people would be on, uh, on one of these entitlements. They would be receiving quote-unquote benefits from the federal government. 21 million Americans would be added to the list of basically entitlement, federal entitlement beneficiaries. This is, this is nuts. And what's even more nuts is oftentimes when the Democrats make an argument in favor of um, increasing entitlement programs, they argue that, well, we need those entitlement programs because of people in poverty, because of low-income people. Um, we, need to, we need to give them a boost up. We need to give them a fair chance. Well, if you actually parse out who would benefit from the Biden administration's plan, the spending, most of these entitlement benefits would actually go to upper income households and middle income households. It wouldn't even benefit low income households or even um, people in poverty. So again, the theme here is big government is a Godzilla. They're not here to be your friend. They're not here to help you. They will destroy your family and they will destroy our country if we let the Biden administration feed the federal government at the rate that they are. The federal government is on its way to becoming a bloated monster. We have to vote these people out of office. We have to. And we have to make sure that we have to make sure that our friends and family know the facts about these spending bills because as the polling showed, I just read through it, as the polling showed, people do not like it when they know what's in it. They don't want these taxes. They don't want these increased costs. They know it'll hurt their family. So make sure they know about it and they know that the Democrats also know that it'll hurt them, but the Democrats are doing it anyway. Okay, so earlier this week, we talked about the story, or I talked about the story of what happened at the TPUSA conference where porn star Brandy Love was originally invited to the conference. She was given a VIP ticket. And by the way, she was given a VIP ticket under her porn star name, Brandy Love. That's not her legal name. And she was invited to the conference, but when it was discovered that she was there, this conference for high schoolers and college age conservative kids, as young as 15 years old, minors, um, she was kicked out of the conference because she was an active porn star. She was taking pictures with these children. Um, and it was inappropriate because of obvious reasons. She's a hardcore porn star. I wouldn't want my child exposed to that, and I wouldn't want other conservatives, other conservative children exposed to that either. And I tweeted at the time, I talked about it on the show, and then I also tweeted, I said, your daily reminder that pornography is a scourge that destroys marriages and families, which are the fundamental bedrock on which people rely instead of big daddy government. So no, porn is not conservative, and I can't believe we're having this conversation. And I did a longer piece on uh, on this, but I wanted to address a couple of the responses that I got on Twitter to this tweet because it's a good conversation. And I think that these, these responses deserve a response back from me. So a Twitter user named Jeffrey underscore Hales said, what about the marriages that watch porn together? Is masturbating bad for marriage too? Just because that may be true for your marriage absolutely doesn't mean it's true for all marriages. That's number one. And by the way, I'm going to condense these replies. I want to just read you. Um, what some of these folks said first. Then the second reply is from Layla Falcon, um, who I think works in the industry, although I can't be sure because I'm not clicking those links again. Layla Falcon said, curious as to what your logic is on how porn, when enjoyed in moderation, destroys marriages and families. So sure, let's talk about this. So porn does destroy marriages and families. That's inarguable. That's simply the reality of, uh, of the thing, and here's why. First of all, porn is a violation of the sanctity of marriage. It doesn't matter if you are watching it with your spouse, you're both violating the sanctity of marriage then because sex is supposed to be within the confines of marriage as defined between one man and one woman. That's the Catholic teaching, that's basic biblical teaching, so Christians all over the world believe this. It is a violation of the sanctity of marriage. It is also degrading to women. Women in pornographic films are reduced to sex objects, oftentimes, Pornographic films treat women with physical violence. It's not just uh, consensual lovey-dovey sex on a bed. It's degrading to women. Women are not treated well. And that's as they're portrayed actually in the film. Off, off the film, there's incredible exploitation and abuse in the porn industry. Um, and we're talking about rape. We're talking about revenge porn. We're talking about underage children who are sexually abused. Um, 
this is not good. This is something you don't want to be exposed to, that you don't want your spouse exposed to, that you don't want your family exposed to, because, especially for young people, because it's a promotion. These pornographic films are a promotion of a twisted concept of sex. And what I mean by this is if you go to some of the most visited porn websites in the country, the, the top searches, the top keyword searches, so basically the type of videos that people want to watch, the type of pornography that people want to see, these are some of the top keywords. Lesbian, stepmom, teen, milf, stepfather and daughter, rape, unconscious sex, abusive, teacher-student. That's what's inherent to pornographic films. So it doesn't matter if you watch this in quote-unquote moderation. It doesn't matter if you're watching this with your spouse. It's wrong. It's gross. It's disgusting. It also promotes infidelity. There was an American study, a study of people who watch pornography in America, that found that porn watching is correlated to infidelity in real life. And that's not even taking into account that many people consider watching porn to be infidelity in and of itself because it is a sexual act outside of the confines of marriage, but it actually is correlated to uh, an increase in, in physical fidelity if you watch porn. But here, here's one of the things that I don't think that we tell young men in our country enough, and so I wanna talk about this. Pornography alters the brain of men who watch it. It alters the mental status of particularly young men. The younger the man, the more their mind is altered by pornography. And I'm talking from a scientific standpoint. In 2014, a Cambridge University study found that pornography triggers brain activity in sex addicts in the same way that drugs trigger drug addicts. It also results, studies show, men who watch pornography enjoy real life sex less. And the British NHS found that an increase in erectile dysfunction increased in otherwise healthy young men the more that they watched porn. They thought excessive porn use was the most likely factor at play there. So chemically, studies have confirmed that the dopamine increase um, that men experience from pornography, actually, it's like drugs, that you require a greater and greater dopamine hit in order to feel satisfaction. Just like drug users require a uh, larger and larger dose of the drug they're addicted to to get that high, well, the same with men and pornography. So that's why their enjoyment of real sex goes down and why they turn to more twisted topics. Because the more you watch pornography, the more numb your mind gets, the more numb the pleasure-seeking parts of your mind gets. And so you seek out more extreme things in order to satisfy yourself. That's a really serious um, alteration of your mental status that happens, especially in young men. And then of course, in regards to marriage and relationships, how does pornography um, destroy marriage and relationships? Well, of course, as we know, um, during sex, there are hormones that, are, um, that happen in our bodies. You know, oxytocin, vasopressin, endorphins are all released in our bodies during sex. And these are bonding hormones. But the thing about these hormones is they're value neutral. So whether men experience these hormones in a one night stand or men experience these hormones in a marriage, they actually have the same effect. They cause men to feel bonded to um, their sexual partner. So scientifically, we know that if we bond and break, and bond and break, and bond and break, as would happen when you're either engaging in hookup culture, when you're unfaithful, or yes, when you watch pornography, you lose your ability to properly bond, which damages your ability for future relationships, but it also damages your marriage, your current relationship. Again, you can look at the science. These were, I thought these were fair questions. They were not rude questions asked me. They were not insulting questions. There were no ad hominems. They were asking what I believe to be good faith from people who it appears do not agree with me at face value, but certainly deserve a respectful response. And that is the response that I have to give. Um, again, if you'd like to continue the conversation, go ahead and respond. You know where to find me on Twitter. Okay, on that note, that's all we have for you this week. But before we go, I want to thank our locals VIP of the week, uh, at Marsha76. Marsha, welcome. We're so glad you're part of the Liz Wheeler Show community. And um, we have tons of fun things planned. There'll be more articles, more videos, more interviews, more interactions, all good things to come. So anybody who's not part of the locals community, the Liz Wheeler Show community on locals, please join us at lizwheelershow.com slash locals. 
and you may just be featured as our VIP of the week next week. Okay, until then, think for yourself, use critical thought, question authority, follow the facts, and do not let government or corporate wokeism or anybody bully you into being a sheep. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts. Give us a five-star rating. It really does help when you do that. Give us a glowing review. That also helps. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. I'm Liz Wheeler. This is The Liz Wheeler Show. The Liz Wheeler Show is produced by Jonathan Hay. Executive producer, Chad Abbott. Director of photography, Kevin McRoberts. Editor, Alejandro Figuerilla. Assistant editor, Michael Wall. Sound mixer, Robin Fenderson. Post-production manager, Victoria Metzel. Director of marketing, Emily Washler. Production and talent coordinator, Matt Toffler. Senior publicist, Patricia Jackson. And production assistant, Mickey Pisani. This has been a Soundfront production.